and there's definitely some elements of saturnalia would be recognizable even today. Yes, um, a little bit with some Christmas traditions, probably a little more uh, akin to some Halloween traditions, actually. Very, I think that's fair. And the, the, the date point of Saturnalia is really just coming off of the winter solstice. Mm -hmm. the, the, the idea to, to a degree is for those of you who don't know, in case you haven't noticed in the Northern Hemisphere, it's getting dark earlier. <laughs> Very rapidly, yeah. Yes, <laughs> we're uh, uh, getting shorter and shorter daylight hours. <clears throat> and on our current calendar, this will conclude on December 21st, the winter solstice. The longest night of the year, the shortest day of the year uh, is officially the first day of winter. A lot of people, particularly mid-latitude and more northerly in the western hemisphere associate i think it's fair to say that we we typically associate oh <clears throat> autumn well really most of the uh most of the uh of of the four seasons with various holidays but not actually holidays in which they line up on the celestial calendar we think sure. that summer has ended on labor day here in the United States. We, we probably think that winter is here by Thanksgiving here in the United States. Uh, again, these are all US holidays. We are quite convinced that summer officially begins on Memorial Day <laughs> and they don't. Uh, the the uh, summer solstice is typically June around June 21st, 20th, 21st, uh, St. John's Eve, the uh, Autumnal equinox, or yeah, the autumnal uh, equinox is uh, uh, typically uh, September 21st. And the, the solstice of the winter solstice, the longest night and shortest day of the year, is December 21st. And <clears throat> so here in our, you know, we're, we're a mid latitude here in the Ozarks, mm -hmm. but winter or wintry type weather hesitancy to be showing up by Thanksgiving mm -hmm. where where I came from I have been uh, more northerly regions it's it's around it's typically there by Halloween and so <clears throat> there's definitely some confusion there but from a uh, from a celestial or cosmological standpoint for the the Greco-Roman culture we have a uh, the the darkest longest night of the year and then essentially the rebirth of the sun and then the celebration that follows. And I think that's interesting because it is associated with the sun, but Saturn, uh, the Greek god Saturn is strongly associated with this entire process. Yes. And um, it's, and it's not just a day where we tend to look at particular days Saturnalia was a festival that typically at various times was celebrated for about a week, 10, 10 days, uh, kind of changed a little bit over time, but this was not, this was not, you know, your one day we, we're going to have a party or a dinner. Um, basically, uh, society kind of shut down for a week or a week and a half and they partied. And they partied hard at times. Yes. And, and Saturn is a really uh, interesting, I, iconic god for this festival, this Roman festival. Mm -hmm. Because there's, there's uh, strong elements of duality uh, expressed. We yeah. have um, uh, Saturn being uh, a god of abundance, a god of mm -hmm. agriculture, god of bounty. And uh, so the, the celebrations of food and plenty make sense <clears throat> in that regard. He is <clears throat> a thonic god, a god of the underworld and a god of death to some degree. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, a bit capricious, not as capricious as Pan, but uh, definitely a bit capricious. And was the 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 icon god that they really looked to after uh, Rome suffered devastating uh, 
defeat yeah. in, I believe, with the Carthaginians in the Second Punic War. Yes, yes. And in fact, that it's at that point that uh, mayhem and shenanigans seem to have gone to a greater height uh, with the festival uh, in trying to um, reassert, I guess, their almost their cultural ego <laughs> um, yeah. after being defeated by, by Carthage. And um, it's at that point that you get uh, more violence, um, blood sacrifice, uh, things like that, um, that we don't typically associate with the winter um, holidays. We, <clears throat> we do not. There's, and <clears throat> once you, you start unwrapping the corn for people who are wondering what the heck does this have to do with Christmas in the Ozarks? Well, it has a lot to do with Christmas everywhere because elements of this of Saturnalia worked mm -hmm. their way into the psyche of generation after generation after generation. Uh, sometimes, uh, both in Europe and in the United States, the Puritans would attempt to quash all of it mm -hmm. and do crazy things like cancel Christmas. Mm -hmm. And yet, for a variety of reasons, these traditions in varying and distilled ways would keep uh, appearing and keep manifesting themselves in culture. And I think that it's fair to say that from an archetypal standpoint, elements of many of the things that the, the Greco-Roman world expressed really speak to uh, not necessarily a religion, but they speak to deeper archetypal human needs and truths to sometimes act out in, in the form of plays, in the form of drama, <clears throat> in the form of, of greater participatory theater. And Saturnalia definitely is, a, <laughs> is an abundant cornucopia of these themes. And it's, it's very interesting to dig into. It really is. I mean, and you you have everything from um, being a festival of light and uh, uh, celebrating the solstice and lots of candles and and uh, symbolizing you know, a quest of knowledge and and truth, but which again is something that seems very familiar for the season for for modern observers. Uh, but then you have basically an upending of society at the same time. Yes. <clears throat> and some of that <clears throat> begins to make sense in that that Saturn was associated with a with a mythical pre-Roman golden age in which yes. the 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 mythology of such, and I think this is uh, reflected in some of Ovid's work. <clears throat> that it, within this golden age, uh, Saturn was <clears throat> Saturn had the place of Jupiter. Saturn yeah. was Saturn was the guy in charge, mm -hmm. and to put it very bluntly. And during this time, <clears throat> there was essentially a an agrarian utopia. There mm -hmm. was uh, abundance of. Uh, of all human need, there was a, a sense of innocence. There was a, it, it, it has, uh, I'm sure the, the Romans would have take, take great issue with what I'm about to say, considering how they felt about, uh, um, about Palestine. But they, uh, the, there was echoes of, uh, you know, the innocence of the Garden of Eden in, in a, in a way that might make sense to more, you know, our, our culture. And <clears throat> so Saturnalia was seen as a, as, a, as a time in which there was the freeing of souls into immortality. And in order to express that, you close the courts, you close the schools, you close the gymnasiums, and you turn all of the social norms on their heads and allow um, allow the slaves to talk back, among other things. Yes, um, 
and um, <coughs> to be and to to be treated um, basically on par with with their owners, um, and with no repercussions. And um, so, in essence, every time you hear someone say they wish for the good old days, basically that is an almost an invocation of Saturnalia. Yes. Yes, it, it is. And, and, and a lot of that, of course, makes uh, a great deal of sense. It, it really helps to understand the, the undertones of this particular festival, which, again, as I said, continues to impact our, our traditions even to this day. Mm -hmm. And as good traditions should, it impacts us unconsciously. We do these things <clears throat> without really knowing why. Exactly. Um, but I, I, I find it very interesting as we go along with, through this to the other sort of traditions that have grown up that are more mischief and mayhem uh, of the time of the year, that there is an ongoing theme of, you know, role reversals. And yes. basically um, hinting at people being in disguise, wearing masks, et cetera. And, and actually, as time goes on, that becomes more pronounced and, it, and um, uh, both continues in events during this time of the year, but may also have influenced our, our conception of Halloween and costumes. It, it does. And <clears throat> some of the traditions that we're going to get into on this episode are, are very old world. And without some understanding of this in the background, really make no sense whatsoever in terms of doing something that I, I think one of the things that, that is the reason that these traditions have continued <clears throat> is because they're fun. Mm hmm. Uh, sometimes a little crazy, but putting on a mask, uh, playing pranks on people because they can't tell who you are. So there is uh, anonymity before men and gods mm -hmm. and then considerable amount of alcohol. And yes. you, you put all of those things together and end up with a, a wide variety of interesting in deeply archetypal traditions. The coming back just for a moment with with Saturn. <clears throat> Saturn uh, was was said to have two consorts, one being the goddess Ops, uh, mm -hmm. who was associated with the abundance of grain and agriculture. And interestingly enough, <clears throat> the the his other consort was Lua Mater, or Mother Destruction. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> there is a, there's an innate yin and yang. There's an innate uh, push and pull of life and death and a, a, a tension between the two <clears throat> that is somehow makes sense within this larger context if it's understood correctly. And so you could, can have a, a week-long festival in Rome, <clears throat> ancient Rome, in which you are allowing <clears throat> allowing the slaves to exist as equals you are, are stocking up on gifts for the children mm -hmm. you are lighting candles for truth wisdom and light and you are also hosting gladiatorial games with the understanding that those who die in the gladiatorial games are sacrifices to saturn yes and so uh <clears throat> And, and then it just kind of goes from there that um, there's some indication, though, that um, the sacrifices become a little more intentional than just the gladiators who who have been killed in contests. Yes. Um, and and that's basically you you would have. Um, the ruler of the Saturnalia, who is almost like um, 
an equivalent of the medieval um, Lord of Misrule, but yes. uh, someone that typically would not have power in society would be appointed basically <coughs> king of the games uh, for the festival. Yes. And he would have the power to uh, command people to do shenanigans. <laughs> yes. Forever. If he said to see naked, you had to see naked or, you know, throw him in cold water. Well, they would throw him in, in ice water. Um, and, and essentially creating a, creating chaos, creating absurdity. Yes. Yes. Um, which, again, um, is very reminiscent of uh, the carnival and Mardi Gras atmosphere. It is. It is. Uh, and and I, so I think it's fair as, as we continue to develop that there, there are connections. Yes, I, 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 think, I think there are. And sometimes I think people look at carnival um, and think, where in the world does this come from? And what does it mean? It, you know, is it just some Creole <laughs> combobulation? And no, it's not. It, it really does go back 2,000 years or more. So, Yes. Now, according to anthropologist James Frazier, there, there is that darker side of the Saturnalia Festival. And mm -hmm. <clears throat> in... Um, uh, on the on the <clears throat> there's a historical reference in, on the banks of the Danube. Roman soldiers would choose a man from the among, among them to be the lord of misrule for thirty days. So this is the 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 soldier who is one of their own soldiers who is going to lead the procession of absurdity. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the thirty days, they take him to the altar of Saturn, and they cut his throat. Yes. Yeah, one, one, one of those promotions that you're not sure you really want. Uh, yeah, I think that is incredibly, incredibly fair. The, you know, this, this idea, and of course the, the British uh, or, or the, the English Isles, uh, British Isles, Lord of Misrule, as we've noticed, uh, a sacri exists as a sacrificial king, uh, a temporary king who was put to the put to death for the benefit of all essentially an appeasement to saturn yes <clears throat> and which, which you know which you have to remember this is a thousand and fifteen hundred years later that this is yes, going it on. Is. yes it is and then add add uh, a couple centuries more and the puritans are banning the lord of misrule in england and around the Christmas season, the in in English speaking countries and Protestant uh, countries impacted by Protestant Reformation, mm -hmm. the the Lord of Misrule is essentially forgotten. Right. But but we should note that you know it is it is directly connected with with what we're discussing because it was associated with Epiphany in the twelfth night. Typically. Yes it was. Yes it was. Of course we see expressions in uh, Mardi Gras, in Carnival. And interestingly enough, <clears throat> I can't help but draw some conclusions just as we're talking with a few of the characters that we'll be discussing in association with Old Christmas. True, very, very true. I, I think some will, will, will find some things familiar. <laughs> um, what I find it interesting is, you know, the sources keep saying that when the Puritans did ban the Lord of Mistral, that basically was largely forgotten quickly, which I, I always want, I've always wondered about that because it, that would be very atypical because that's not what happened in basically every other instance of custom when the Romans or the church or kings started um, outlawing observance of something. Yes, <clears throat> yes, and, and I think it. I think <clears throat> the, there's some really interesting um, societal analyses, societal elements of this, and something that that 
we see continually impacting and even impacting Ozark's culture uh, today. Now, <clears throat> going back 2000 years, we, we have a, a Saturnalia festival that was essentially um, obviously very popular, but definitely promoted from the highest levels down. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the, the temple of Saturn, uh, this, the, the overall societal structures of the Roman Empire. So you can associate that with a certain authoritarian aspect. And you see that reiterated when <clears throat> it is chosen uh, to celebrate Christmas over the same season. Yes. And you, you see the again, uh, an authoritarian structure saying, okay, this is how it's going down, basically. Mm -hmm. And, and y'all are going to play by the rules. And they, and folks largely did for generation after generation. Now, what I think is interesting is just in a, a very um, every man level. And of course, something that, that shows up, the, the, the Lord of Misrule is, is sometimes considered the, the fool. And mm -hmm. an, an aspect that we oftentimes miss in this earlier era is that the term fool, we think of it as like a jester, as a comedian, as the goofy guy, when in many ways the fool was understood as the everyman. The everyman and, and actually humility. Yes, um, humility, innocence, the beginning of journey, uh, not not somebody who's got his pocket stuffed full of jokes exactly or or the buffoon not the buffoon either yes and because people you know i think you know look at that imagery and are like they 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 don't typically see an association with themselves and right. in the case of the every man the fool actually being the every man that <clears throat> The, the everyman, the everyday people over the course of time made these traditions and these archetypal processes into their own. It was not uh, a, a top-down situation. It was something that wa was very much from the bottom up. And they even if they couldn't fully articulate why some of these things were very important they they intuitively knew they were important and so fast forwarding to uh early american settlement and and even what we think of <clears throat> now is the the beginnings of a commercial christmas say in the 1860s 1870s into the early 19 1900s early 20th century there was suddenly a uh, an emphasis, and we'll get into some of the details on this, but a, a push to get rid of these silly old folklore customs in a, you know, in the name of a more homogenized, a more domesticated, a tamer, a nicer Christmas with uh, a jolly old elf and perhaps some, you know, very stately church services instead of the raucousness of uh, of an older and in their minds mm, backwards uh generation true and you know there is there is a corollary to early, early settlers in the ozarks is that um there are a lot of accounts of of uh, travelers coming through uh commenting that in the early early towns and settlements that um, they don't see an observance of Christmas the way that they're um, used to, but that there, there is just a lot of partying and drunkenness and silliness going on, um, uh, it, it, including brawling and things like that. And so you would, you see those accounts throughout the Ozarks and it's easy to, look at it and say boy what 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 was wrong with them that they didn't observe christmas but in essence they're really observing an older version of it and a much older version of it and 
for for a variety of reasons. I think that there's these, the the there's a an archetypal need to up in society, if only for a day or two. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there's there's uh, an an archetypal need to accept the darkness of the season. There's an and and <clears throat> something that we focus on a lot particularly in terms of the Celtic traditions and the Anglo-Saxon traditions that are associated with All Hallows, Hallows Eve is that Halloween is very much a dark festival in terms of mm-hmm. the, the season because we are at, at the point of October 31st into November 1st, uh, the, the days are getting shorter and shorter and shorter and we are hurtling toward the solstice. Yes. Um, this this originally Saturnalia and later Christmas uh, season period is immediately following the winter solstice. Mm -hmm. And so it is a sudden uh, raucous boisterousness of having, having made it to the point that suddenly the days are getting longer, there is suddenly more light. That's true. And, you know, I, I do find it interesting that, and, and, and perhaps this is why, you know, when the, the rise of the Puritans, um, uh, this came to an end, but by the time you get to the Tudor period, um, you would have this, the, the uh, Feast of Fools and, and the Lord of Misrule, uh, even in the king's lodgings, wherever the king was lodged, they would have one. And it would start, by that point, the rule of, of the fool would start at Halloween. And so that makes and, sense. And so it would start at Halloween and continue um, through um, the solstice period. And so, and it would include uh, disguises, masks, mummerings. We'll get to mummers later. Um, and um, with all kinds of games going on. And um, the, this would happen and um, basically entertain the court <clears throat> from the end of October through... <laughs> the through epiphany so you you would have more than two months of of this going on <laughs> so i think the puritans probably said okay that's enough <laughs> in all fairness it was probably overwhelming yeah it probably <clears throat> was after a point <laughs> there's just coming back as i think it's important to lay some of the groundwork mm-hmm. that there's, there's a, a couple of different reasonings potentially for the use of masks. Mm-hmm. Um, one of them is in this, this uh, theatrical role reversal of society, upending everything in absurdity that you could potentially don the mask of someone that you're not and pretend to be of a, essentially of a class or a, a stature that isn't you and vice versa. <clears throat> and to, considerable merriment, delight, and possible embarrassment. Mm-hmm. There also seems to be a, a possible, you know, the, the, the mm, hints of a humanitarian evolution in the blood sacrifice that the, uh, the sacrifice becomes symbolic in the, the sense that a, a persona is sacrificed and the persona has to be donned and then sacrificed with the right. use of a mask or a costume. And <clears throat> so we see those kind of undertones of putting on the putting on of masks, the wearing of masks, the celebration of, of decorative uh, masks, pretending to be other people. Right. And, and, you know, actually, this might be a good segue into... Um, basically 2000 year old um tradition of mummers and mummery yes um, that it really did come out of saturnalia um and uh, people may be going what are you talking about mummers and mummering um but um mummers 
are basically in various places. Uh, there are either formal parades. Philadelphia is one, and actually it has a connection to the revolution, ironically, and the founding of America. Uh, other places, um, mummers basically go house to house um, uh, uh, and interchangeably caroling and pranking. Yes. Um, and they wear absurd uh, costumes, um, which uh, actually... Uh, for those of you listening that um, you see, you will often see pictures of, they say, old time Halloween costumes. A lot of those pictures are actually of mummers, not Halloween costumes. Yes. Um, and uh, they often will uh, cover their faces, etc. cetera. And um, they're, they're often um, sort of gender bending costumes, et cetera. And um, uh, everything from caroling to violence to murder has happened. Well, because there's a certain amount of anonymity mm -hmm. within the raucousness. <clears throat> it is very much uh, Halloween trick or treating for adults. Yes. And depending upon the uh, particular community, I would say even community rather than culture, the, the community, it, it could be um, on, the, on the level of almost a, you know, a violent 19th century strike in, uh, in urban America, all the way down to a <clears throat> very... Um, playful and kind stopping in at your neighbors and asking for some cider exactly exactly but this generally does occur at christmas time not halloween so yes there you go. And, um. uh, and and for people who who are accustomed to mm, i think it would be fair to say that we have old christmas and new christmas for mm -hmm. uh and by new christmas i mean what we think of and how we celebrate christmas that for for folks who are so you know are, are inured within the idea of new christmas elements of old christmas seem absolutely alien they do um but a lot of that you know a lot of quote new christmas you know comes out of the mid to late 19th century early 20th century merchandising uh, very much so it's Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and the Jolly Elf. <laughs> yes, which, which for the record, let's just, let's just uh, include that. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer has some very dark social undertones. Yes. <laughs> that, uh, and um, Which really it, fits in with murmuring, really, you know. Surprisingly, you it does. Um, but, but I think also speak to a a a, a mid a simmering mid 20th century uh social tension and uh and desire to fit in that mm -hmm. is clearly not part of a boisterous old christmas that uh, really throws all of that i think this is <coughs> oh, oh my i'm going off on a tangent um me and my marshmallows but that uh, for folks who don't know and might be listening and new, Josh likes marshmallows. So there's a, <laughs> a lot. And uh, <clears throat> there, something that we, let's, let's I, I wanna you know, dive into this, just a, a comparison, old versus new for a moment in terms of social, mm, social archetype because <clears throat> this new Christmas, in all fairness, has a, a lot of social tension associated with it. Yes. There's, <clears throat> and, and we, can, we can start with, with Rudolph, the, the biggest issue. And there's some very, I, I read the origin of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, and it's actually very sweet. 
um, and, and certainly some important reasons why it has resonated with millions of people. And I grew up watching it. Most I people. Do too. Uh, I have it on DVD, in case anybody wonders. Don't hate. Uh, I've already watched it this season, and I may watch it again. <clears throat> However, there is the, the unspoken social tension that the real issue is Rudolph and Hermie just want to belong. Exactly. I mean, that's fundamentally, that's fundamentally what it boils down to. And in the, interestingly enough, in terms of comparison to Old Christmas, which does have its traditions rooted in Saturnalia, the Lord of Misrule, the turning of everything on its social head, the reversal of, of strata, is actually the opposite of belonging. It is having a raucous celebration over not belonging. True. That that that's true. Almost yeah, celebrating that and and uh, if, if you hate gift exchanges in the office and bad gifts, you can blame it on Saturnalia as well. Well, that's true. And uh, but <laughs> you know, just imagine how much more fun that uh, that office party would be if you could just you know dunk all of your uh uh you know your your superiors in water and force them to sing naked <laughs> and and with with zero repercussion that that's true the 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 zero repercussion might be uh um something appreciated by by people at certain corporations and one of one of the things that I just I do find interesting with 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 mumming, um, with the mummers essentially the mummers dance. And for folks mm -hmm. who are big Lorena McKinnett fans, spoiler alert, that would be me. <laughs> there is a fantastic Lorena McKinnett, who's a Celtic a Canadian artist, uh, who really came onto the world stage in the late eighties. <clears throat> Um, in her 1999 album, Book of Secrets, has a song called Mummer's Dance. And so mm -hmm. I've been familiar with the concept since I bought the album. Right. And it's a fantastic song. After you're done listening to us, I suggest you go look it up on, uh, you know, your music platform of choice. <clears throat> but there is a particular uh, Irish tradition around mumming that that seems that you know the possibility that mumming was actually quite mm, was adopted very early on and developed in Ireland and then potentially spread throughout the British Isles from from Ireland and of course uh, Ireland also has a, a really really strong um, um, you know Catholic base mm -hmm. Uh, the many of the first churches in the British Isle, many of you know Catholicism in its in its origin points, where it was often established in Ireland before anywhere else. And it makes me wonder, from a cultural standpoint, if some of these essentially Lords of Misrule traditions did not, and the the raucousness of of, of the mumming tradition did not actually begin in Ireland as a result of of this, and then interact and develop and evolve in association with the uh with the celtic peoples themselves it, it could be ironically though it, it seems that um the the mumming tradition was brought to um at least uh, the united states by swedish immigrants ironically. which is an, an, an interesting aspect and <clears throat> that and so the, there's the, there's a couple of different things and this is going to play into some of our discussion with Belschnickel which is coming right up <clears throat> but mumming is <clears throat> really really two things in one one of them is it's a folk play that, mm -hmm. that deals with um, various themes the you have the hero combat play 
you have the sword play and you have the wooing ceremony. And the most popular is the hero combat play and the most popular hero of the hero combat play is traditionally St. George. And his combatant is not surprisingly the dragon. Right. Um, I, uh, I, I'll play the dragon just in case anybody wonders. <clears throat> but <clears throat> so that you, you have this sense of, uh, you know, ritual and carnival and theater, but you also have, so you have the, the mumming play <clears throat> and one can presume that the mummers are, are adopting elements of these characters to yeah. some degree when they develop their character and, and get ready to go mumming. But in addition to the play, there is also the going from house to house, uh, singing, dancing, being boisterous, raucous with a fairly high degree of anonymity, and then asking for mm, cakes and alcohol. Yes. And actually some aspects of this, you know, um, as things evolve are very analogous to uh, cosplay and role-playing games, etc. today. Yes. I mean, yes, um, and, but again, mummer plays and mummer parades are something that are, is very much alive in a lot of places. Um, as far as parades, there's one in St. Louis. Um, and, and actually we, uh, we may actually um, have the Mummer Parade in St. Louis to thank for the inspiration for Tennessee Williams becoming a playwright. Oh, I did not realize that. Well, that's because you didn't read all the notes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Tennessee Williams part I missed. Yeah. Um, yes, he um, I think was, that was fascinating. Uh, we sure that, I think that one was behind a paywall. The, uh... Oh, no, it wasn't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, we'll talk about that later. But, um, but no, uh, actually, yeah, mum, the mummers um, were an inspiration for him um, to start writing. And um, so there's another connection to the Ozarks because it happened in St. Louis. Absolutely. Um, but... Um, um, it, it's funny that in some places it, it seems to come out as uh, done in parades, which reminds me very much of the parades during Mardi Gras. Uh, in other places, it's more house to house, like uh, almost like a trick or treat, more trick than treat. Um, and um, there have been occasion in the past where um, there was violence and most notably in 1861 in Newfoundland when um, mummers actually attacked three men uh, and beat them up and one of them passed away. Which is unfortunate. Uh, <clears throat> and I think that the, again, you know, we have the Swedish connection, but we do seem to just have this very strong Irish connection associated mm -hmm. with a lot of this, of this tradition. <clears throat> and we, in, in association with Nova Scotia, we see a very, very strong Scots-Irish influence. Mm -hmm. And in early America, um, um, it really got started in Philadelphia, ironically, during the revolution, um, and um, mummery events were put on to celebrate um, General Green on his retirement during the revolution, because he ended up retiring because of health. Uh, and George Washington enjoyed them so much that he promoted um, mummering um, and it became official events while Philadelphia was the temporary capital. <clears throat> and I think that's I think that's interesting because you know in, in not that much longer um, mm -hmm. and this this was something that was really <clears throat> interesting to me from a from a folkloric standpoint it wasn't too many generations after that that these traditions really began to be regarded as very old-fashioned 
very associated with rural America, and we're, we're largely being put down in favor of a more commercial Christmas. Mm -hmm. But I, I think the key word there is commercial because, you know, uh, merchants didn't make a lot of money on these traditions, to be very candid. <laughs> Well, that's a, that's a very good point, especially since everybody was just making their own costumes. Yes, and that is point that, 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 that is part of, part of it is, is the, the process of actually making a unique costume and it being your own. Um, so that um, as the economy changed and things became more commercial, um, there was a built-in incentive to discourage it yes <clears throat> and and <clears throat> some of that of course is associated with uh, uh more staid aspects of protestant reformation because we're we're dealing with traditions that are very boisterous that in some cases as you already mentioned do lead to violence there's a considerable amount of alcohol being consumed in the mm -hmm. in the process but <clears throat> i think a, a larger point <clears throat> was and this may or may not be fair i'm just thinking aloud but you you really at the at the juncture point of the the american industrial revolution following uh the civil war we see mm -hmm. essentially nation building at its at its peak during that time a, a monumental nation building with the idea of uh from a from a educational standpoint the the creation of many of our, our essentially American myths uh, associated with uh, personas and characters of, of, of an earlier time. And <clears throat> from, a, from a tradition standpoint, you really begin to see the uh, coalition of, of expectation in this development of, of, of new tradition of, mm -hmm. And, and, and this is really centered around an American Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> there's, you know, something that I, I think many people could rally around after the Civil War, after the devastation of the Civil War, that yes, we, we, we lost so much, but we gained a unified nation out of it. And that unified nation was creating its own culture. Yes, and focusing on things that were not as depressing as the loss of the in the war, um, and more hopeful, more childlike um, versions of, of these traditions. To be perfectly honest, not not to offend anyone that you know modern Christmas and the is more childlike but in a lot of ways it is it is and <clears throat> that although we see this now as a very old-timey and nostalgic thing at the time it was i i think being viewed as more of a uh a modern and a positive step forward and this mm -hmm. is during during a, a you know late late or later victorian period with a heavy emphasis on the innocence of children and the importance of childhood development <laughs> and so certain elements uh, of, of Christmas, tra Christmas traditions would maybe, you know, expanded upon and other traditions pushed aside. And, you know, the idea that let's, let's celebrate the innocence of childhood as opposed to, uh, you know, encourage our, uh, you know, 18 to 25 year old men to get uproariously drunk and rampage through the village. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> as fun as that is well you know i like it the <clears throat> the, the 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 other aspect that i think is you know just in, in following with this <clears throat> is the fact that many of these traditions became regarded as um as very out of date, out of fashion, um, to use you know our hillbilly term, 
that's what the hillbillies would do you don't want to be like those people um, right you don't and in some cases you don't want to be like your parents or your grandparents you need to be modern you need to be cosmopolitan you need to be with the times you need to be civilized and <clears throat> without uh and and i find this to a degree i find this a bit sad because this you know you see essentially a, an older generation which had grown up uh with generation after generation you know prior going not just back to the old world but presumably much further having carried on the these time-honored traditions that interestingly enough speak to deep Jungian and archetypal needs yeah. uh, that say important things that help alleviate um social tensions within the larger community that that help express uh important and fundamental aspects both good and bad about humanity in a comparatively controlled way mm -hmm. <clears throat> that uh you know in the longer run in many cases may help build community may help build society may help us be more uh complete people and say you know a general in generalization here say in the 1840s to the 1880s you have a uh, you know a couple of new generations of uh, um, you know potentially central missourians and southern indiana and indianans and and uh, ohioans and pennsylvanians and west virginians that, who are going uh you know we need to get rid of these old traditions grandpa and grandma and mom and dad are stupid they don't you know right. we don't know why we do these things how can you be so dumb and mm -hmm. they're these grandparents and these parents who grew up with these traditions had no response and and often and often uh the older generations would encourage you know sort of that mar marching of progress you know mm -hmm. uh, go be more cosmopolitan go be more sophisticated um because they thought it would help the next generation get ahead further yes and um uh, <clears throat> and and you you know i i uh, for me i and i i've watched I, I've watched this process um, firsthand. I've, mm -hmm. I've watched these processes take place in, in very immediate proximity. And there, you know, of course, the, the previous generation, when confronted with, uh, hey, I, you know, it was, um, you know, and, and the accusation of defend your position. Mm -hmm. Well, it's only been something that we've been holding an ancestral memory for mm, two millennia, <laughs> but we don't technically know that. We just know that we do it. Right. Um, and, and part of that, I think, kind of came out of the, the sense that everything has to be uh, rational and scientific minded that there has to be a reason for it and what is the reason for this that fits society now um and just the idea that this is something that is very human and um continuous is not a sufficient answer uh correct correct and it, a lot of this, I think this is, this may be a, a broad reaching statement, but I think that a lot of the mm, thinness of modernity is really represented in this transition of traditions. It's a fair statement. I, it, it, it really does illustrate the artifice of modernity. And and the tension that uh, appears to be inherent, uh, and, and by tension, I'm talking about these <clears throat> the these newer or more modern social expectations 
And those social expectations really reach their crescendo uh, with Christmas, with modern Christmas. Yes. Uh, can we afford enough gifts? Can we afford the right type of gifts? Is our, our, our Christmas decorations extravagant enough? Uh, are we, you know, all of these things, which of course it comes down to intent uh, because, you know, we can have a lot of fun with these modern traditions, but, you know, I kind of, it kind of makes me mm, particularly interested in, in some of these older things. And one of these older things that, that I think has some misconception, thank you, the office, is Belschnickel. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um... And I was never really a fan of The Office, so I actually didn't see those episodes, but uh, I didn't I've heard them, I, but, but right I've heard them referenced, you. but I have heard them referenced. Um, and, um, you know, I, I find Bell Snickle interesting. I mean, there's similarities with other characters as well, but um, basically he comes from the lore of southwestern Germany along the Rhine um, and uh, really came to North America with the Dutch and um, uh, maintained a presence uh, in tradition continuously, particularly in the Pennsylvania Dutch communities and, and also in some other areas, including um, uh, particularly Indiana, if I remember right. Um, but, um, basically I think, I think the modern conception is Bell Snickle is sort of a country version or a country Santa Claus. Yes. yes. Um, and, um, so you see a lot of folk art, uh, quote Santas that are basically Bell Snickles, but Technically, it's not the same. Um, you know, typically, uh, Bell Snickle uh, travels alone. He's not directly a companion of St. Nicholas. And um, he does tend to be rather ragged, old clothes, disheveled. Um, his appearance uh, would, would, uh, would be more akin to. Um, you know, someone on a street corner that most people walk by and and won't put a dime in their their tin cup. Yes, ironically. And there, it's <clears throat> one one thing that I I am only playing with speculation at this point, but there there are two very old traditions that I'm, I'm interested in, you know, potential connection. Mm -hmm. And one of them is we've already talked with the, the um, Lord of Misrule or the mm -hmm. more Saturnalian Lord of Misrule. And <clears throat> this, uh, this lone winter solstice figure really makes me wonder uh, a little bit about that connection. The yeah. other is the Northern European um, wild man or green man. I hadn't really thought about the green man connection, but it's possible. It, <clears throat> there, there, there were some elements uh, within the research this week that, that just made me wonder. And, and, and essentially because uh, Belschnickel to some degree, uh, certainly to the, the children of the rural communities, uh, the rural German communities of, uh, of early American settlement saw Belschnickel as uh, essentially the wild man coming out of the woods. That's true. I mean, that, that, that's true. The, and, oh, go ahead. Oh, oh I was going to say, and, and, and he, he, he plays a role that's different than Santa that um, where Santa might leave you a lump of coal, he, he will um, uh, be a naughty child with a switch, so. 
Yes, and and that actually brings us to another point that I find really interesting from a um, from an old world Northern European standpoint. Typically, the switch is made of birch. There is mm -hmm. a strong association with birch and birch wood and the magical properties of birch in many of these characters. Yeah. That's true. That's true. So, I mean, it it, it is more of a reminiscent of elven uh, lore. Yes. Uh, of the Fae, um, which again, um, Santa Claus has origins in the same lore. So, um, but Belschnickel does come across to me as more of a character that fits a bit in the realm of the Fae. Yes, <clears throat> I think that's, I think that is a, a very apt comparison. And we're, we're jumping around a little bit when I'm on the, uh, the next one. And I, I'll come back to Belschnickel. Belschnickel has a very strong connection with the Ozarks because mm -hmm. of the, the rural German population that yeah. settled in both Arkansas and Missouri. And mm -hmm. <clears throat> so there, there's, you know, I, I think, but, but also, and I remember us discussing this in depth in our episode in the cold winter months uh, about uh, German culture in the Ozarks is that <clears throat> German settlers and German settler generations into the Ozarks, into Missouri and Arkansas uh, beginning in the, the late 1830s into the 1840s and continuing in succession um, in the 19th century, did almost too good of a job at cultural homogenation into becoming Americans. To the point that, that people now studying it think that they really didn't have any, uh, a footprint, basically. Yes, uh, uh, essentially the the erasure of of culture, the self erasure of culture. Um, but I think that I, I'm going to I'm going to posit that the culture did not self erase so much as it became unconsciously or subconsciously inured within. Yeah within the families and so the the elements of german culture are all there but they are not recognized as such even by those who are um promulgating them and you you see it in uh the way for example the way that um that farms are kept you see it in the mm -hmm. recipes that are passed down you see it and and one of the things that i think is very powerful is the is a mm, love in many cases i'm speaking of people that i know personally a, a a particular and very heartfelt and innate love of of christmas mm -hmm. that um really is, is, as you get to know the people in question uh, more closely, you, you realize this goes deeper than, uh, you know, the, the trappings of 20th century media. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you there. I, I do agree with you there. <laughs> Uh, the now the birch the birch I find really interesting I want to I want to dig more into that mm -hmm. um, but <clears throat> jumping over to Necht Ruprecht yes there were there were some interesting things and, and in this case we're we're dealing with the companions of Saint Nicholas mm -hmm. um, Belschnickel Belschnickel just exists within his own terms there is there is very much that that <clears throat> winter fay element, uh, yeah. Because it's it's pretty clear Belschnickel is not following Santa Claus along, and uh, heck, even Krampus follows Santa. Bel yeah, 
Belsnickel just does his own thing. And yeah, he's like, you know, what they can do whatever they want over there. I, I I've got this. <laughs> <laughs> and and part of the uh, fear and wonderment associated uh, with Belsnickel was for the children because they didn't actually know what night he was going to show up. It wasn't like, because Krampus is even polite enough to show up on St. Nicholas Eve. That's true. That's true. Uh, Belshnickel was more random. So, you know, nothing like a, a, a little bit of built-in terror there. So it, it is. And there's, so there, with, uh, with Nick Ruprecht, um, of course, again, strong German background, uh, essentially farmhand translates to approximately farmhand Robert uh, or servant uh, Rupert or servant Robert. That would be the approximate translations. Uh, but he's uh, uh, a companion of St. Nicholas. He's described in the folklore of Germany and really just starts showing up in the literature in the 17th century uh, in the Nuremberg area. Yeah, and I find it interesting that um, the Grimm brothers basically associate him with um, House elves, basically. Yes, um, I, I I find the I find the connection of kobolds to be of particular interest with that group break, and a a commonality between nearly all of these companions of Saint Nicholas is uh, Saint Nicholas is there to bestow the goodies upon the good children, and all of these companions and or other characters are there to punish the bad children. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Nick Rupert, he could do either. And technically, Belschnickel would too. He would reward good children with with nuts and can and and candies and so forth. But um, right with the penalty that, like good little German children, you just sit there and don't touch any of the candies <laughs> while Belschnickel is there. You have to wait. <laughs> Otherwise, he will hit you with his birch stick. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you have to prove that you're good. <laughs> yes. And uh... <laughs> probably in triplicate. <laughs> quite, quite possible. And <clears throat> but there, there's a number of key elements. And of course, the um, the Grimm brothers reference is the first and most probably the most important and association of Neck Ruprecht with the Fae. Mm -hmm. um, but, others? But, yeah, go but ahead. You, I, I wonder though, if part of the reason they did associate him with the Fae is that there is this thread, this element with all of, with many of these characters such as Belsnickel that, that are very representative of the Fae. <clears throat> yes. And I, and I find it interesting, and there's, there's going to get to, I'm going to jump over um, <laughs> um, to uh, Zwart Piet for a moment, mm -hmm. uh, who in, in modern terms is a very problematic character. Yeah. Uh, because... <clears throat> And it's and it's, and it's essentially a, a medieval or post medieval character, particularly in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and in northern France, and is part of the the folklore of the of the Low Countries. And I, I am going somewhere with this because <clears throat> there's in part of the tradition of Zorthviet is that he's a Moor from Spain. And that would have made sense in terms of a mm, exotic companion to Saint Nicholas. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that, and, and again, following the same uh, punishing ill-behaved children by beating them with a birch rod, um, and and giving out gifts to the good children. Yes. So the, the behavior of the, the elven neck group uh, the potential fey wild man of Belschnickel, and the currently deeply politically incorrect Schwarzbiet, 
uh, from Spain <clears throat> is their, their behavior is, is very similar. It, 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 it is, it, it very well is. And in fact, um, with uh, Zwart, he, you know, he might even uh, take the naughty children back to staying with him in his sack, much like Krampus would. Um, now, for the record, I've been to Spain. I will totally be naughty to get thrown into a sack and packed off to Spain in December. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Just gotta get that that uh, that sack on the airplane, right? <laughs> Top shelf only. I'm not gonna fit. Let's just be honest. <laughs> oh, definitely not gonna fit in the overhead compartment. But there is something that I that I find really really fascinating, and I just I want to get your your thoughts on this. <clears throat> we have the the reference of Nect Ruprecht. Sometimes he rides on a white horse, and sometimes he is accompanied by, and I find this an interesting, men with blackened faces dressed as old women, gender bending, or by fairies. And there's a, a strong uh, topsy turviness, obviously associated with the fae. Yeah. We Which have. Is... Go ahead. Go ahead. Which again, just, uh, you know, is very reminiscent of Saturnalia, murmuring uh, dances, etc. It is. Um, Neck Rupert, I believe, is associated with Birch, as well as the White Horse. We have um, Joar Tpiet, who carries a birch rod and his face is blackened. Mm -hmm. We have Belschnickel, who carries a birch rod, whose face is blackened, uh, presumably by soot. Well, you know, going up and down the chimneys, you know. Yes, and so, so now I'm gonna either diverge from <laughs> Saturnalia for a moment, um, possibly, reference the older Etruscan customs that may have predated Saturnalia. So now we're down to like 3000 mm -hmm. years ago, but also reference some of the Fey experiences that have been recorded uh, with, with individuals experiencing in real life. We're no longer, no longer talking about folklore, but actually experiencing um, firsthand of the mm -hmm. Fey. Okay. And something that's very fascinating to me and, and difficult to explain effectively is that in a number of first person experiences with mm, the little people, I suppose, is that they often are reported very mm, Rip Van Winkle esque. Mm -hmm. Yes, that that they're they're miniature people with magical powers, uh, oftentimes male mm -hmm. and female, that they are that they appear old, that they appear wizened, yes, uh, and that their skin appears dark. We're not saying ethnically dark, but just dark. Right. Um. And you know that um, that can just come, you know, be from age as well. So, yeah. so I, I guess you could look at at these characters that are either companions of Santa Claus or on their own, like Bill Snickel, um, as being described this way as a way of being a metaphor of being very old. Yes. Um, or beyond time, even if if, if, they, if they are magical. Yes, uh, uh, I, I think that's a good point. I think something that's beyond time or out of time, I think it, it makes a lot of sense because you're the the concepts are that that they have knowledge, they have secret knowledge, 
about whether the children are good or bad, et cetera. Um, and will basically sometimes try to stump them, make them answer questions to determine whether they're going to be honest, um, that it, it does seem to indicate more than just helpers or um, happenstance. Um, Yes. I, I, I do think it is sort of more of the understated Germanic way of referencing the Fae where the Celts and the Brits sort of just kind of put it out there over the top. <laughs> I think that's I think that's very fair. And you know, I I, I personally can't help but hmm, speculate that some of these traditions really began with actual encounters with the Fae. Well, I, I, I think that is, that's a, a good point because um, you, you, have, you do have these tales that go way back of encountering these creatures and, and describe, describe the same way as Bill Snickle and these other characters. Um, encountering them in the barn, encountering them in, in a field, that kind of thing. And then when you come to North America, you have Native American uh, encounters described very much the same way. Yes. So, I, you know, I think that, I, I think that it is true um, that um, these characters are described in ways that are described of much broader experiences. And there's <clears throat> something that you hit on that I think is uh, uh, a, an important theme that's consistent is uh, Nick Ruprecht, um, uh, Piet Zorth, Piet, um, Belschnickel, they, they query the, the children they ask them important questions they they challenge them mm -hmm. uh it is there is a an initiatory element that is involved something that jumping over to uh celtic and english folklore with the the fays with with the fae the fairies <clears throat> uh encounters with the fairies involve questions they involve riddles they involve uh, initiatory um processes and interrogations in order to pass the test in order to get what you want yes and and, and almost the inverse of that in some instances that you you don't necessarily have to pass the test but if you ask for something you you have to really put thought into the way you ask it because um, it's almost a game to the Fae to give you what you asked for, but not in the way you asked for it. Or or yes, give give you exactly what you asked for, much to your dismay, because that yes. wasn't what you meant. Exactly, and so. Again, it's a duality. I mean, the, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that's pretty important is that through all of these subjects <clears throat> that we're discussing, duality is a constant theme. Yes, and, and, and appropriate for the season as we're passing from darkness into light. Yes, and, and I, think, I think that is something that most people don't really think about too much in contemplating the Christmas season is that duality and passing from one season to another. I think we get so wrapped up into the day itself and the celebration that what comes before and the difference after um, doesn't come to the conscious mind the way it used to. I, I agree. I agree because we we have a very uh, almost well a very industrial or mechanical way of viewing 
the yeah. seasons, the passing of the seasons. Just as a as a little bit of a a, a quick on a side mm -hmm. uh, with neck rubric, uh, I, I did find this note interesting, comparable in appearance to the Pennsylvania bell snickel. Uh, but there is a, a really dark telling of his legend of farmhand Robert in that uh, St. Nicholas of Myrna and, you know, his patronage of children and repentant themes. And we, we have this story of, uh, of a criminal named Ruprecht who butchers three children. And then St. Nicholas miraculously resurrects them just in time for Christmas. And Ruprecht is so astonished by this that he converts and uh, then tags along, but apparently is still a little bit sinister because he, you know, beats the kids who are bad. Yeah. So yeah, not 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 completely reformed apparently. No. Um, <clears throat> but again, that 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 really has uh, echoes of Saturnalia there, yeah. um, and the idea of uh, of a sacrifice. Um, yes. So. Um, so it may have been, uh, you know, um, sort of a trace memory that's unconscious as these this lore developed, but it certainly seems to have been a affected by it. I, I think that's I think that's very fair in terms of potential conjecture and <clears throat> something I, I, I referenced much earlier Etruscan um, belief structure. But from what I, I've read, from what we can tell, uh, the the Etruscans may have been the first in Europe, or maybe one of the first, there may have been multiple, who regarded the hearth as sacred and magic. Yes. And <clears throat> consequently, we see a lot of, we see a lot of magic associated with the hearth and consequently the chimney above it. Yes, very good point, very good point. Um, and I think most people and probably even practitioners of magic today um, not are, are are not always cognizant of the fact that magic often was centered around the hearth. Um, that doesn't happen so much in modern practice, but um, but I do. I, I do like the, the connection with the chimney and then of course the, the lore of Santa Claus. Um, this is this is an interesting uh, quick Ozarkian reference, but in February of, was it 1862 or three that Alf Boland was killed? Uh, two, 62. He was, uh, he was bludgeoned to death on the hearth. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> With, with an iron poker at that. <laughs> at that, so. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, the Fae never got along well with iron. Yeah, that's, that's what I was thinking as I was, <laughs> as I was saying that. And, you know, it, you know referencing Alf Bolin might be a good point to um, uh, reference the, conne the connection with the time and the, lore of the wild man in northern europe i think so i mean and, and <clears throat> it, there it was be... a wild man it was alf Bolin, so i was going to say that uh is is it is a mm, now you've got me thinking but <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, the 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 wild man appears <laughs> the wild man appears you know throughout uh continental europe mm -hmm. Uh, is a character who is dressed in furs with pants made of pine cones carrying a club or an evergreen tree. Interesting that it's an evergreen tree. Thank you, Christmas mm -hmm. tree. Um, and in this particular article, it actually says that the archetype of the wild man, ubiquitous throughout Europe, would later serve as a template for characters like Belschnickel. So there we go, as a, as, a, as a possibility. But essentially a European boogeyman. But there is... Mm, much more to the archetype of the wild man mm -hmm. that is, is really interesting uh, the the grim story iron john references the wild man and mm -hmm. in it's interesting because so many of the uh, of grim's fairy tales deal with um 
you know, archetypal stories, interestingly enough, for girls uh, becoming women. And yeah. something that gets missed in the, uh, in the retellings oftentimes is that the good, the, the, the villains and the heroes of the story that the, uh, the, for example, the, uh, the Prince Charming, as well as the Wicked Witch, can very realistically or effectively be seen as, as various facets within the psyche of a maturing girl. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the, the idea that this is not, that, that when we are uh, becoming disdainful of these uh, silly tropes, that we're actually missing the sophistication of the story because the story is not meant to be simplistically representing, for example, three characters. The story is meant to be representing uh, the archetypal journey within, uh, mm -hmm. the mystical journey within of, uh, of, of the journey into adulthood and the, the leaving behind of some things and the gathering of others. And so from that perspective, the, uh, you know, the, the, the archetypal motif of Prince Charming is actually the girl herself saving herself mm -hmm. in, um, in choosing decisive action. And, you know, I think that there's a, a layers of ancient sophistication there that gets missed in a lot of our thin modernity. I agreed, and particularly in with some of the cinematic retellings. <laughs> Which inspired beautiful fake castles. Um, <clears throat> I've only been to one of them. It was nice. <laughs> yes. The... <laughs> I've, been, I've been to two. <laughs> <laughs> one of them's taller. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I I do want to go to the original, um, but that and, that go ahead. and 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 honestly, it's my favorite. Oh, to that's be honest, nice. I like it better. That is very cool. That is very cool. I would I would really like to go. I um, that said, the uh, the 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 story of Iron John mm -hmm. it is really interesting because rather than the the archetypal journey of a young woman. It is the archetypal journey of a young man. And mm -hmm. he is forced to confront said wild man. And certainly for about the first third of the story, you can, can really see the wild man as the villain, mm -hmm. as, the, as the antagonist of the story. He's the, he's the character that, uh, that the rest of the kingdom is afraid of and they lock in a in a in a cage in the courtyard and the the young boy is very intrigued uh by this uh by this character uh but also very terrified of him at the same time and mm -hmm. come to find out unlocking the cage of the wild man he unlocks the cage of the wild man and the wild man carries him off in the forest he he steals him and there uh puts him through a series of initiatory processes to become a man himself and so there's a there's a great deal of, of uh, there's a wealth of archetypal knowledge in this and the 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 wild man of european motif really seems to represent this and there's a certainly a, an interesting correlation between the wild man and the green man there there is and then there's also when you think about it um the wild man um motif figures prominently in um lore in north america including the ozarks i mean including a literal uh yes wild man um and um uh, you know i think it's uh interesting that um th the the thought of a wild man inspires such fear, trepidation, and paralysis of the psyche. Um, and um, we see it, you know, in tales of uh, Sasquatch, we see it in tales of literal wild men. 
uh, like the Arkansas Wild Man, uh, as well as the as the older tales in Europe, um, and it has sort of universally had the same effect. And and I think it's interesting if you go back far enough that uh, as far back as the seventh century. Um, they would outlaw the practices of anyone wearing clothes made of skin, you know, basically fur skins in January as a way of uh, discouraging this uh, idea. And that is interesting to say the least, because it's, <clears throat> again, I think it, it speaks to social anxiety in regards to these ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and, and really, if you want to look at it from a, from a Jungian uh, standpoint, it's, you know, the, the, the fear of the beast within. Yes. Yes, it is. It is uh, the, the fear of the shadow. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in this particular case, I think highly resonating source, it's, it's, <clears throat> can be feared across the board, but I think it's particularly resonating for boys. And mm -hmm. I think that that is one of the reasons that we see the attraction of belschnickeling, the verb, not the noun, yeah. uh, of uh, raucous young men uh, dressing up in costume and uh, <laughs> causing a ruckus. <laughs> exactly um and um and really you know uh it, it's a um catharsis um yes. by doing this and 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 i i find it very interesting that we these activities kind of bridge uh halloween with the turning of the seasons as well they do and <clears throat> there's there's a great quote uh, december 26 1979 from the harrisburg pennsylvania telegraph bell snickles in the most outlandish costumes were out in droves they infested the stores and played on antique instruments as a prelude to passing around the hat and generally departed with a parting salute on their tin horns some were quite proficient as musicians, but the majority were simply frightful. We regret to say that some of them were the worse for the liquor. <laughs> <clears throat> well, there you go. That 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 that's been a constant for two thousand years, but with, with these celebrations, <laughs> there there's. Um... <laughs> Oh, there's there's definitely a um, a causal relationship. Yes, I, I think so. But um, I, I I do think uh, a cathartic uh, purpose to it all that um, modern observation of Christmas time does not have in a satisfying way the same effect. Yes, I, I agree. And certainly one of, one of my personal takeaways from a lot of this uh, research in this episode is going a little bit easier on ourselves mm -hmm. in terms of holiday expectation. Yes, uh, we tend to set ourselves up for failure um, and perfectionism and these traditions basically celebrate the exact opposite imperfection and fallibility and um satire really it, it does um I, and i like that uh I, I like that idea i like the idea because because these celebratory characters that both incite fear but also wonder mm -hmm. uh they are uh, they're dirty, they are uh, disheveled, they're unkempt, they're they're a little scary, but they're having fun. Mm 